I can't help but begin with you on inflation. It's been two whole generations since the United States last wrestled with raging inflation. And of course, now prices are soaring again and financial markets seem increasingly uneasy. Are you worried about inflation? Uh, I, I am worried about inflation. I mean, infl inflation is uh, uh, excessive inflation. Uh, everybody wants a little inflation. And by the way, let's remember, Eric, for the last 20 years, every country in the world has been trying to get 2% inflation, and they haven't been able to do so. Uh, a little inflation is good. It keeps everything kind of uh, moving. But excessive inflation, uh, defined as much more than two, is not desirable. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, in short, for the most part, higher inflation means higher interest rates. Higher interest means lower asset prices. Uh, and and that's, that's what's uh, going on right now. And higher interest rates could also throttle the economy. Do you feel like the post-pandemic recovery is now in question or at risk? Um, uh, I don't think it's a, I mean, first of all, uh, you know, I proudly assert that I'm not an economist, <laughs> but, but as you know, but um, I, I think that we're gonna continue to have a recovery, but uh, I think that, you know, uh, with higher interest rates, all else being equal, it 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 won't be what it otherwise would have been. Low, low interest rates are an incredible stimulant, and and so the economy will be less stimulated. Howard, when we spoke a few months ago, you described assets as being in a quote unquote everything bubble. You may recall, and you urged the Federal Reserve to let interest rates normalize. What I want to know yeah. is this: Should we want? Do you want? Does Oak Tree want? Jay Powell to use this opportunity with inflation staring us in the face to prick the everything bubble, or maybe it's already been pricked. You know, I, I, uh, I don't think that the Fed should try to manage asset prices, but I think that it should uh, try to uh, create an environment which is conducive to the economy uh, doing its thing. Uh, and, uh, but I also believe that other than at the extremes of overstimulation and, and hyperinflation or recession, or uh, I think that the Fed should be rather relatively passive. That's why I called for uh, hands off and, and let's have naturally occurring interest rates. So uh, look, interest rates I think have been artificially low. They were made very low to, to get us out of the pandemic uh, lockdown of the economy. Uh, they, that certainly has served its purpose. The economy turned very strong. Uh, has been very strong, and uh, uh, that strength is the demand related to that strength is to some extent con contributing to the inflation we have. I think that interest rates have to rise. Uh, the economy has to be less stimulated, and uh, but we're certainly we're seeing that uh, more interest rate increases sooner than the Fed had previously led people to believe. All of this will will cool off the economy to some extent. So here's the question. The Fed thinks it can be incrementalist, right, with these rate increases bit by bit by bit. But I don't need to tell you, because you've been around longer than me, soft landings are notoriously hard to achieve. What if the policymakers are wrong? And beating this round of inflation requires something like Paul Volcker's Saturday Night Special of October 1980. Well, first of all, let me respond to the second part of your question. Uh, it, uh, we don't have inflation like Volcker faced. And, you know, uh, Volcker came in and inflation was considerably higher than we have today. And it had been going on for six, seven, six, seven, eight years. Uh, we don't have that condition today. Uh, uh, so it's not going to take what, what Volcker did. I have a a note on my wall at the office saying the rate on your loan is now 22 and three quarters. We don't need 22 and three quarter percent interest rates. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, look, the, the, the people, I assume that people only work at the Fed who believe that they can engineer changes in the economy, at, which they desire. Uh, you called it uh, soft landing. And, you know, you have this this knob and you turn it a little bit at a time till you get it to get the economy and rates to exactly where you want them. Uh, in my opinion, that overstates the ability 
of economists to act with precision. Uh, uh, and so, uh, you know, it's hard to get exactly what they want. And uh, the first interest rate increase may not cool off inflation very much, and the second one may do a little more, and the third one, but then the fourth one may uh, impinge on growth. Uh, it's very, very hard, in my opinion, to get these things exactly right. Howard, since you were actually managing money back in 1979 and 1980 at the time for Citibank, and your co-chairman Bruce Karsh is a similarly experienced investor, what is the Oak Tree view? on how to invest in inflationary times? Well, I think that if you, if, if you think you're going to be living in inflationary times, you, you should have things which will do, or we, you should have some things in your portfolio which will do right, well under that scenario. So number one, you might have want to have more floating rate debt than fixed rate debt, because fixed rate debt goes down when rates go up. Uh, you may ha want to have more uh, uh, properties that you can uh, rent out at, and where you have the ability to increase rents over time. Uh, comp companies that grow fast enough to outpace inflation. These are the traditional uh, ways to deal with inflation. That's number one. Number two, I would not, as I said in a recent memo, I would not invert my portfolio. I would not throw out everything I own and buy a bunch of what I just described. That's going too far. And, and, and what if you're wrong? And what if inflation cools, cools off naturally? You know, uh, eight months ago, Jay Powell thought inflation was going to be transitory. What if it turns out, now he doesn't, maybe he doesn't think so, but what if he turns out he, he was right then? Uh, so, you know, you just do little changes uh, at the margin in my opinion. Uh, Oak Tree is not a macro investor. Our investment decisions are not uh, directed by uh, macro forecasting uh, because it's so tough to get it right. And so, you know, I think buying good assets at attractive prices for the long term is still uh, the best tool in any uh, in investment scenario. But if the Fed, to take the other point of view, if not, it's a point of view possibility. If the Fed loses control of inflation and has to jack up interest rates, that does have implications for credit investments, certainly for, for fixed rate instruments. It, it has implications for the prices of, mm. of uh, fixed rate investments. Remember that you buy a 5% bond, you pay, you, you, you put out $100, you get 5% interest a year. Uh, interest rates go up, the price of the bond falls to 75. If you're right about the credit worthiness of the issuer, you get a hundred. You get your money back at the end. You get your hundred bucks back. Uh, so when when you're a, a credit investor, as we are, we used to call it fixed income. You know, you shouldn't care that much about uh, prices are going to go up or down, and so you should buy or sell. Returns in our area have we have the great luxury that the returns in our area are contractual. <laughs> the the borrower get, takes your money, promises you interest, and promises your money back. Your return, in the ultimate sense, does not come from the market. It comes from your borrower and your contract with him. And people shouldn't get excited about buying and selling and getting out in time and then getting back in in time, which is so hard. If they have entered into a credit contract with a good borrower, they're going to get the, the, the yield that they signed on for. And then they should be happy with that. I'm so glad you brought up buying and selling, Howard, because your latest memo is is something of a, a, a I might even call it a mini manifesto against selling, because there are, as you explained, many reasons not to sell at any point in time, many reasons. But yeah. the reason I'm bringing it up is because timing is, as they say, everything. And some people are going to read this memo whether they should or shouldn't, as an exhortation not to sell, just as the stock market's off to its worst start since 2016. And I, is that what, I can't imagine that that's what you intended them to think. No, I wanted to sell for the right reasons and not the wrong reasons. And, and, but, but most people, most individuals, and I dare say, Eric, I, most people listening to this program don't have the ability to time buys and sells. And for these people, I'm, and I, when you mentioned timing, I thought you were going to the quote from Bill Miller, which I used in my 
in my memo, and Bill Miller is one of the great investors of our generation, uh, and he said, it's time, not timing, that works as an investor. Time in the market. And getting in, getting out, hard to do. Being in over time is what makes people successful as investors. Now, a great professional may be able to add a bit to that by getting in, by getting out, or well, overweighting this, and now overweighting that. But uh, very few people can do so successfully. Uh, and uh, I, I, so I, I, I think most people trade too much, Eric. Sure. And, uh, and, and most people trade to their own detriment. Well, and I mentioned the fact, sorry, you want to say something? No, I wanted to ask you about Oak Tree. Oak Tree is not a bunch of traders either, right. but you've right. traditionally made money by capitalizing on market panics and buying at distressed prices. And that, by definition, requires having to sell some things at some times in order to raise cash to deploy at opportune moments. And I'm, I'm wondering if that's where we are yet. Well, uh, you, I, I hate to say it, but your question's a bit fallacious. Because me. <laughs> what, we, what we have historically been able to do successfully is raise additional money in anticipation of, of, uh, of uh, buying opportunities. Ah. When we saw fundamental problems in the investment environment, that is, I'm not saying we foresaw a dip. We saw when we see fundamental problems in the investment environment, historically, we have gone out and raised additional capital, which we were able to deploy uh, at, at, when, those, when those problems arose, uh, depressing asset prices. I see. And that... So we, we, were, we did not sell... Uh, a matter of fact, one of the tenets of our investment philosophy, of which there are six, says that we are not market timers. We do not, we do not sell uh, in advance of uh, of, uh, of a coming dip because there, it's so hard to get that right.